Hey, hey, I'm Keith, and today I'm going to show you how I built this walnut sideboard with push-to-open doors using a material called Valchromat that is 30% more dense than MDF and has a solid color all the way through. Also, push-to-open drawers with brass accents on the sides and a soft close. So kick your feet up, grab a seltzer, and I'll show you how I did it. Refrigerator not included. And I'm just realizing these legs... They weren't built to kneel for this long. Oh mama, that's a cramp. Oh God. So the first order of business was to chop down this piece of 10 quarter walnut into more manageable pieces for the legs, aprons, and stretchers. So after jointing and planing it, I could work on laying out my parts. And here's a quick gander at the SketchUp drawing, just so you know what the heck we're building here. All right, so I didn't have a great scenario for nice straight grain on all four legs, but I can get one out of here for the front leg. And if I flip a roo, or flip dunker, no, flip a roo, I can get a back leg out of this kind of yucky grain back here. Now for the front apron, I have nice long straight grain across here. The back apron I'll get out of this piece here. And then I can resaw this down the middle, chop it up into pieces for all my stretchers and end aprons. So over at the miter saw, I'll cut that leg chunk into two chunks, which will give me two legs out of each chunk. What do you think, Jerry? Nothing? Whew, tough crowd. Next, I could lay out my legs roughly on my blanks just to confirm how the grain was going to look. So there are my two legs. I have this much material in the middle to play with. So what I want to do is run my saw right up the middle of that. And right on cue, let's split those lines on the bandsaw. Then I could head over to the table saw and rip the larger chunk that was left over for my aprons and all my middle stretchers over to the bandsaw to resaw it down into roughly one inch. And then I could surface it nice and smooth, get those cut marks out of the way. All right, so after I got these milled up, I was able to yield an inch thickness, so that's perfect. Back to the miter saw to cut those to rough length. And then I'll stay right here and put a three degree miter on the miter saw and cut one end of the legs. Since these are splayed out at an angle as well as tapered, and then I could head over to my tapering jig on the table saw and taper those legs. And as you can see there, I had just enough height capacity to make that through cut. Whew! Then it was back to the miter saw to cut it to final length, and there you go. A tapered, splayed, angled leg. Oh, but the fun's just beginning. Back at the table saw, I set it to a five degree bevel because each leg gets a five degree bevel on two sides. Okay, so I ran into an issue when I just ran all those through as I was double checking the width. And as you can see here, it's just under two and a quarter at the top, but at the bottom, it's just under two and an eighth. So somehow when running it through there, it put a taper on it, which I don't really understand because whatever this cut is, it should be parallel with the fence. What I did was I glued on a block on the bottom, which basically made this now a rectangle, and I ran it through and it came out perfect. So something about changing this angle made it cut perfectly parallel, but when it's down here, it tapers it. Maybe someone in the audience is a lot smarter geometrically than me and can explain why that's happening. In any event, now I gotta go back and make all my first cuts to square these up. I just used double-sided tape to glue on a wedge on the bottom. And because the saw only goes up to about three inches, it leaves a little bit here, which I can just hit with a block plane to clean that up. All right, so cutting the second bevel has become even more challenging. Not only do I need to wedge this thing up, I can't just ride it along the fence because this can happen. So I have to make sure that this top edge is on the fence and that it's in the same plane as the outer edge of the wedge. So I'm gonna use double stick tape so everything is lined up like that. This is against the fence. The corner of this is against the fence. And then that'll give me my second cut here. I don't think this is unsafe, but I don't think it's the best way. And there probably is a safer way to do this. Easy. 
All right, I just noticed this created a new problem. Now it's tapered the inside. So at the top here, I have a little over an inch and a half. At the bottom here, I have a little over an inch and three quarters. So that didn't, I don't know. In any event, the outside is correct. I mean, this isn't super critical. I'd really like to know why that is happening to prevent it in the future. So maybe I just went in the wrong order. I can't explain why this is happening. I'm sure there are smarter people that can, but I'm not one of them. So I'm gonna move on. So now I need to get this angle here for the apron to be cut at. To do that, I'm just using my bevel gauge and it came out to 12 degrees. Just to note, if you buy the plans and decide to build your own, this angle will be determined by the taper that you cut. It may vary slightly from mine or what's in the plans. To join the apron to the legs, I will be using the Festool Domino. And to aid with the gluing and clamping process, when I glue all this together, I'm putting a couple pocket holes in the aprons. And I'm using a five degree wedgie here, which is an off cut from when I tapered the leg on the table saw. That gives me a flat surface to plunge the domino and then a three degree bevel on the top of the end apron so they line up flush with the top of the legs. Now it's time to get fancier than I need to. I'm going to create a facet on each leg on the front showing face. And if you purchase the plans for this build, they will include two different versions of the legs if you wanna keep it simple. In fact, this facet is completely optional and isn't even included in the plan. And then grabbing one of the leg offcut wedges, I use that in the vise to get a nice square clamping surface. And then just start planing until Lola runs away and just work my way down to that line, one final pass, and that's what you get. Just a subtle design detail. And then I round everything over with an eighth of an inch round over bit. And then clean that up by hand with a little sandpaper. Glue up montage. Engage. So while this assembly is in the clamps, I've made some corner blocks here, which will just tie all four corners of this space together and give it a little bit more strength. All right, with those legs and base construction firmly in my rear view, I could move on to the carcass, which will be made of three quarter inch walnut veneered plywood. Now the top will be mitered to the two sides to create a nice waterfall grain effect. So I am making those 45 degree angle cuts with my track saw. Now, if we look at the SketchUp model here and we zoom in on the carcass construction, you can see the top is mitered and water falls down, but the bottom is just a butt joint. There's no reason to wrestle with another miter joint because that's never going to be seen. So the table saw will square that off. And then I give a name tag to all my parts so they know who they are. Now I'm going to join the sides to the bottom with dominoes and pocket screws, but the dividers I'm using the lamella, which you may have seen me use before. Now this is a luxury tool. I understand not many people have it. It is totally not necessary here. You can either use pocket screws on the inside of those middle dividers because they will be hidden by the drawers and the bottom can be attached to the side with just pocket screws, which I use pocket screws and dominoes, but just pocket screws will work. Now the lamella is fantastic because I can use these little Clamex connectors that act like clamps and all I'll need is glue, and then I can tighten those connectors down, and I don't need to fight with clamps during the glue up process. Now the back of the cabinet will be a sheet of quarter inch walnut plywood, but I only need to cut a groove in the top and the two sides because it will end up sliding right over the bottom of the case, which you will see later in the video. To add the edge banding to the shelves, I'm yet again going back to the lamella with these snap-in connectors. Again, totally not necessary. Glue and clamps is all you need. And to glue on the hardwood edging of the dividers, just glue and clamps. Then I can clean that up with a block plane, like some kind of hybrid woodworker, and grab the random orbital sander. However, it's a little bit long, so I trim those pieces flush under the watchful eye of Shopcat Jerry. Another thing I like to do before the case is assembled is drill all the holes for the shelf pins. So I'm using this little woodpecker's jig. You can make your own out of pegboard or get crazy and mark measure drill or eyeball it. 
And just a little tip when drilling these out, if you start the hole with the drill in reverse, you'll have much less tear out. So I'll show you an example next to each other of what happens when you do it both ways. So this is reverse. And finish forward. And then this will be all forward. This was went in forward the whole way and these other ones started in reverse. Much cleaner holes. Oh, hey, did you know that I'm on a podcast called the Shop Sounds Podcast? It includes myself, Jason from Bourbon Moth Woodworking, and Nick Key from Key Woodworks. We're a woodworking podcast about nothing. So check the link below to tune in and subscribe. And it's not really about nothing. I mean, even nothing is something. I'm on a happy, happy boy. I'm just a big old one, a happy, what? We're rolling. Hey, hey! Okay, so I have all my drawer parts milled up. Everything is milled to exactly 5 eighths of an inch. I like 5 eighths for cabinet drawers because it's a little beefier. Half inch to me looks a wee bit chintzy. So I go with 5 eighths. Now I actually did an entire YouTube video solely on the drawers for this project. I went through different joinery methods, how you can level up your drawers using brass accents. So I'll put a link on screen and down below if you want to go check that out after this. Now I need to cut a groove in all my drawer sides that will accept the drawer bottom. I set that depth at a quarter of an inch and then I can move my fence over so it is a half of an inch up from the bottom. I'm going to be making two passes with a dado stack. If you don't have a dado stack, multiple passes with a regular blade will do just fine. And that's the fit we're looking for. And then I ran all my parts through the table saw at what might appear to be an improbable speed. Now to cut the rabbit joint, I'm going 5 16 of an inch deep, which is half the 5 8 thickness, and then obviously 5 8 of an inch in, because that is the thickness, and that is the fit you get. Once I know that setup is good, I cut the rabbits on all the other parts. All right, and here are our parts for the rabbit. So when that's glued together, that'll look nice. Simple, but effective. As you can see here, I've marked out some locations where I'm going to drill holes for some brass pins. I use some corner clamps to secure everything, and then I'll drill those holes in. I'll be using these quarter-inch brass rods that I'll cut into pins. I think they'll give a nice contrast between the walnut and the brass. Now, a better idea for this whole operation might be to glue the drawer together, let it dry, then drill the hole for your pins, and insert them and glue them. That way there's no danger of the holes getting misaligned. Now another joinery method I used in the drawer video I referenced earlier was a locking rabbit, which looks like this. It is also cut on the table saw. Creates a nice, strong joint. The machine cut dovetail was another method I covered in that video, this time using the Porter Cable dovetail jig and a router, which produces something funky looking like this, but creates one heck of a strong half-blind dovetail that goes together with the soft, rhythmic tapping of a dead blow hammer. Voila! Voila! Ta-da! And another method I covered is using pocket holes, which is a perfectly acceptable method, especially if you're going to cover it with a false front. I use this method all the time. And just to show you, I mean, all the drawers in my shop were built with pocket screws. You can't see them, but on the front, all joined with pocket screws, and then the false front to cover them all. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be using bloom undermount slides, which require this notch to be cut out. And then this chunk here that is left after those notches are cut isn't really necessary. So I like to remove that so I can just slide the drawer bottom in after it's assembled. So I'll rip those off on the table saw, but a word of warning, you cannot do this on the dovetail version. Watch the drawer video to find out why. And now, Let's cue the sanding montage. This is almost, almost as fun as it looks. A word of warning, do not go ballistic with your sanding process here because it could affect the final fit of your joinery. And now a little glue up action. This is the brass pin version. Just need a few clamps on all sides. Double check for square by measuring the diagonals. Looks good. Did you have a good nap? No. Don't sass me, young lady. And stay away from my yogurt. So this is just my jigsaw with a metal cutting blade flipped upside down in my vise to cut up these brass pins. And I'm using epoxy here to give me the necessary strength to bond the brass to the walnut. Total boat, baby. 
I did another version with brass bars, so I cut some tight-fitting grooves on the table saw for the brass to slide into. And because this was a little experimental, on one side I did a quarter inch with an eighth inch next to it, and on the other side I did two quarter inch strips next to each other. Now for more information on the complications and pitfalls of working with brass and wood, please refer yet again to the aforementioned video, How to Level Up Your Drawers. Now for the drawer bottoms, I'm using what's left of the quarter inch plywood that will be used for the back. Now a quarter inch to me is just much too thin for a drawer bottom, so I'm laminating two pieces together using contact cement. And I'm using a fast cap roller here just to make sure I get nice, even, consistent glue contact between the two pieces. Look at me go! And the great thing about cutting that tab off the back of the drawer is it's very easy to get a measurement. And with said measurement procured, I could cut those to size on the table saw, give them a nice rub down. And the other thing I do for the edge that's sliding into the drawer is I round that corner off just to make sure I don't hit any resistance or catch on anything. And with all the glue up, sanding, and surface prep in my wake, it was time to apply the finish. And for this piece, I'm using Rubio Monocoat in walnut. I mean, how can you get better than walnut on walnut? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. So now we just have to put the bottoms in. And yes, I put a little glue in here. There's nothing wrong with doing this with plywood bottoms. If you were doing solid wood bottoms, then you bet your glue booties, you can't glue that. Or you can in one spot, but they need room to move. I just like a little glue, prevents the drawer bottom from rattling. couple of screws secure that bottom to the back and a quick flyover of Lola and the drawers. Lola, what are you doing? Alrighty then. So I'm using this little Rockler undermount jigget guide, which is a fantastic little jig for drilling all your holes for your undermount slides. It's completely symmetrical so you can flip it from one side to the other. There's a drill bit with a step collar so you don't go too deep. You can drill your holes for your locking devices. And as you can see, these actually go in at an angle and the jig conveniently is angled for just such a hole. So I can do both sides. The jig also allows you to drill the holes in the rear of the drawer that accept the locking tab of the drawer slides. And then that symmetric Cality feature allows you to slide it over and do the other side without any marking or measuring either. Then it was everybody's favorite, glue up time. And as you can see, I pre-finished the inside of the case. Whenever you're working with a hand rub finish like Rubio, trying to get in those corners once a piece is fully assembled will really chafe your backside and give you premature carpal tunnel. Neither of which do I recommend. Now, as you can see, the sides were attached to the bottom using dominoes and pocket screws and clamps. The center dividers were attached to the top and the bottom using the lamello fasteners that I mentioned before. Just a tightening of that Allen wrench squeezes them tight. You can see the glue squeeze out there. And then I could put on the lid, line up those miters, pop them in place, and then tighten everything down up top. Over at the table saw with my blade beveled to 45 degrees, I started making the walnut trim that would cover up that plywood edge on the front of the case. This is basically just an applied frame that I cut at 45s on the corners and glued everything down. Using these Rockler bandy clamps holds everything in place while I check fit and measurements. And then I could glue everything down. And admittedly, I used a couple of 23 gauge pin nails to hold it in place. And once everything was dry, I could flush up that trim with the case using a block plane and a sander. And as you can see there, I had a little blowout with the 23 gauge pin nail, which I just filled with some sawdust and wood glue. Now on the back of the case, I used some iron on edge banding. I cut it at a 45 degree angle, so it actually looked like I had put real wood on there. And just a little buying tip when you buy walnut edge banding, be sure it has dark wood adhesive and not a light adhesive. Otherwise, you'll see a white line where the edge banding meets your plywood. Then I made one final pass all the way around with the block plane to even everything up and remove any remaining saw marks. So for the door fronts, I'm going to be using this material called Valchromat. Now this is a high density MDF product that is colored all the way through. So no matter where you cut, you'll see the same color. 
Just thought this would be a cool idea to use on this. I'll have a link below if you wanna order some of these. Now, typically you can only get this in four by eight sheets, but this one place in California carries it in these two by two panels, 24 inch by 24 inch. Now I'm going to use Benjamin Moore water-based poly on these. I tried some Osmo, it got really dark because the oil shellac, just weird. Um, and the Benjamin Moore uh, really kept that bluish color. And here it is on the gray. To fit my doors into their openings, I first took a measurement of the actual opening and then cut the doors exactly to that size. Well, exactly might be an exaggeration, as close as possible. I put some risers from below so I could drop the door in place. And what I do is I push it flush to two sides and make sure that's square and then using a 3 seconds of an inch spacer, mark my reveals all the way around, and then I can cut to those lines with a track saw. Sometimes openings just aren't square, so you need to cut to those lines. Well, isn't that smurfy? Then was as good a time as any to get my door hinges installed, so I got my mounting plates drilled and then went to work on the doors, cutting the 35 millimeter holes for the cup hinges. Now I'm using this Craig jig, which I really like this thing. It's super convenient. You can set your reveals, you can pre-drill your holes. Now I'm using Bloom Inserta hinges, so these do not need to be screwed in. When you lock this latch down, the sleeves you inserted into those smaller holes expand and lock it into place. Now. Even though I had green tape on my drill bit, I did go a little deep on these two. So, using some CA glue and some sawdust, I was able to mix up this little paste and fill these holes. And because this Valchromat has bits of sawdust and wood particles all showing, it's kind of busy, so once you fill these things and sand it smooth, you really can't tell. And before I could apply any finish, I hand sanded all the edges to remove any saw marks. And I am going to spray these, but I actually hit the edges with a brush first just to saturate those with as much finish as possible. And then I could bust out the HVLP. And as I mentioned, I'm using general finishes, high performance water-based top coat. I ended up putting five coats on each door with this stuff. I just wanted to give it as much protection as possible. And since this Valchromat is water resistant, there's no grain that is raised or anything. So just a light sanding in between coats. And then it was Rubio time. Now, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, my Rubio process is pretty straightforward. I spread it around with a plastic spreader, work it in with a white Scotch-Brite pad, let it set for five to 10 minutes, and then wipe off the excess with a microfiber cloth. And with that done, I could get on to fitting my drawer fronts. So I'm using a 3 32nd inch reveal all the way around. So I cut these little spacers and then I can just kind of fit everything in. And then the same process as the doors, I go around on all the sides and mark my 3 seconds. Now I usually use a white chalk pencil, but I found this white ceramic pencil that I sharpened to a point with some sandpaper and it works great for marking on walnut. And the ceramic lead is much stronger than the chalk. Then I just cut to those lines that I made on the miter saw and I can double check my fit on all those fronts. And once those drawer fronts are sized correctly, I could clamp them to the drawers and secure them with screws. Now I opted for no visible hardware on this piece. So for the doors to open, I'm using these little push to open mechanisms. They just get secured to the cabinet above and then boink and boink. Now is a good time as any to slide in the back, which the inside is finished. While everything was apart, I pre-finished the back with Rubio. And then with some screws, I can secure it to the case. Now, some of you might be wondering, why are you using soft closed door hinges with a push to open mechanism that isn't soft closed? And others of you might be wondering, how is his skin so white that it's blue? Both are perfectly valid inquiries. But back to the hinges, the soft close still prevents the doors from slamming shut on that little mechanism. And the soft close can be turned off on the hinges if you want. But if I ever decide to take away that push to open mechanism, I got soft close hinges ready to go. So, like the Cheesecake Factory menu, it gives you options. To attach the base to the top, I'm using these figure eight desktop fasteners. They just get recessed into the base and screwed down and then screwed up into the bottom of the cabinet. All right, grab your life jackets, folks, because this is where we venture into uncharted waters. I have never used these Movento slides with the push to open and soft close. It's pretty easy to assemble, but as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts. 
the blue motion unit, which slides in, and then those angled tabs. And then you need to measure for the synchronization rod, which helps each drawer slide operate dependently of the other. So once you cut that to length, you slide this little adapter thing in there, secure the slides, and then pop in that synchronization rod into these two little notches, and then patiently wait for Jerry's QC check. And yeah, well, looks like it was approved. Then it was time to find out if not reading the instruction manual was the right move. The master at work. <laughs> that doesn't that work? <laughs> Push to open. It's supposed to be soft. Hello in there. Why aren't you working? Oh, there we go. Just gotta give a little oomph, huh? Yes, oomph. A subtle oomph is required to get that to engage. Now, unbeknownst to me, the Movento slides have different locking devices than the traditional Bloom undermounts, so these are a bit different than the ones I showed you before. Why must there always be a problem? Okay, now we can get these drawers installed. As you can see here, this one went much easier when you actually give it the right amount of oomph. And then I could attach the drawer fronts. I like using double-sided tape, so I have my spacers below. I use tape on both surfaces, then line up that reveal by eye, which can easily be adjusted if necessary using the locking devices on the drawer slides. Then I could clamp that in place and drive some screws home. And now we're in the home stretch here. I needed to attach the base to the cabinet using those figure eight fasteners. So I just go around, make sure I have equal spacing, and then using some number eight wood screws, I secure everything. And then with the help of my buddy Bourbon Moth who flew all the way from Oregon just to help me flip this over. And there you have it. And since my Rice Krispie knees are still bothering me from the intro, I thought I'd sit down for this one. And I think from this camera angle, this thing looks ginormous compared to me. It is five feet long, but the angle is really making it look like an aircraft carrier. It's not that big. So let me know what you think in the comments below and don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out our podcast, the Shop Sounds Podcast. And now to pop a couple Advil for these knees.